musical and Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Congresswoman Gerald's Senior Telephone Town Hall. Today's town hall is focused on how to protect yourself and your family from financial frauds and scams. My name is Kelly Doucette, and I am one of the Congresswoman's sister directors, along with Jill Hirsch, who is also on the line. While we are waiting for everyone to get on, I'm going to quickly run through some of the logistical information for today's event. We will begin the town hall with opening remarks from the Congresswoman. After that, the Congresswoman will introduce her guests to get to today's discussion started with some helpful resources and information. We had a large number of questions already submitted when people signed up, so we will get to those shortly afterwards and open up the line for live questions at the same time. If you would like to ask a question, please press star three on your phone at any time, and you will be connected with one of our staff members and then put in the queue to ask your question live. When you are given the opportunity to ask your question live, Jill will call on you. Please try to keep the question brief so that we can get to as many questions as possible in the time that we have together. If we do not get to your question today, you can email it to the Congresswoman by going to cheryl.house.gov backslash contact. Any questions you may have regarding needing assistance with a federal agency, please feel free to ask your question and your call will be promptly returned by one of our caseworkers who are also on with us today. You can also always reach out to our district office at 973-526-5668. And without further delay, I will pass this over to Congresswoman Cheryl. Thanks so much, Kelly. And thank you to everyone for calling in for today's Seniors Telephone Town Hall. I'm so grateful to be joined by some incredible guests this afternoon. Joining us today are Assistant Special Agent in Charge Bobby Hernandez and Technical Staff Assistant Scott Keenan at the United States Secret Service. We have Acting Director of the New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs, Carrie Faith, and Acting Essex County Prosecutor, Ted Stevens. So thanks all of you for being here today. Our panel will be discussing how to protect yourself and your family from financial frauds and scams. Uh, seniors deserve to feel safe and secure without the concern of predators lurking, whether online or in person. Older adults tend to have greater wealth due to years of hard work and savings, and this makes them prime targets for scammers and swindlers. And this problem can happen to anyone. A member of my staff's father, who was a prominent emergency room doctor, was scammed into making a fraudulent investment. It was embarrassing for him to admit this to his family, but it shows how easily it can happen when we are caught off guard. The former CIA and FBI director under President Reagan, William Webster, was also targeted. Webster and his wife were prospective marks in a Jamaican lottery scam in 2014 when an unsolicited caller informed Webster he won a sweepstakes. To collect his winnings, a car and millions of dollars, Webster was told he needed to pay $50,000. When the couple declined repeatedly, the caller became abusive and threatening. The Websters called the FBI and later worked with special agents in the Washington field office to nab the scammer who is now serving time in prison. As our senior population continues to expand, it's crucial to bring to light the warning signs of elder fraud, the crippling impact of fraud and financial scams, and how to prevent being taken advantage of. We all have to be aware, vigilant, and report suspected or attempted financial fraud or scam. As for my work in Congress, I was proud to vote for critical pieces of legislation to help combat fraudulent scams aimed at older Americans. I recently voted for the Empowering States to Protect Seniors from Bad Actors Act, bipartisan legislation that will create a new Senior Investor Protection Grant Program to support state enforcement agencies and task forces charged with protecting and educating seniors on financial fraud. This bill is now awaiting a vote in the Senate. This Congress, I also voted for the Senior Security Act of 2021, a common sense bipartisan bill that would create a Senior Investor Task Force at the SEC that will exclusively focus on how seniors are being targeted by those who seek to take financial advantage of them. Every two years, the task force would be required to submit a report to Congress outlining trends and innovations like robocalls and voice spoofing to help us stay ahead of changes in financial scams as they arise. Before we get to our guests, I also want to quickly debrief on historic legislation that will have significant impacts for seniors. This Past month, it and helped shepherd into law the Inflation Reduction Act. The biggest change for those of you who are seniors on Medicare is the limit on your out-of-pocket costs on medication and vaccines. 
Under the IRA, vaccines will be free for seniors starting next year. Starting in 2025, your out-of-pocket spending on drugs will be limited to $2,000 per year with some transitions starting in 2024. The Inflation Reduction Act will also cap how much seniors spend on insulin to $35 a month, a critical cost savings for the more than 3 million older Americans who use insulin to control their diabetes. The cost of insulin is an issue I have heard about from constituents since my first days in office, so I was proud to see this provision make it in the bill for seniors and hope to see it expanded to everyone in the future. The bill also makes several other changes to limit price increases of drugs overall. Most significantly, the measure directs the government to negotiate what Medicare pays for a small group of drugs starting in 2026. In 2026, the first year that drug pricing will be up for negotiation, the list will include the 10 drugs that Medicare spent the most money on the prior year. By 2029, that list expands to 20 drugs, including medications filled at pharmacies and drugs administered by doctors, such as some chemotherapy treatments. The cost and the savings goes up significantly as more and more drugs are added. Programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are some of our greatest triumphs as a nation. And as your member of Congress, I'm committed to protecting these programs and ensuring everyone can retire with dignity. So thank you all. Now we'll go on to some initial remarks from our guest speakers on our topic today, fraud and scam prevention. We'll start with Bobby and Scott at the United States Secret Service. People don't always think of the Secret Service for cybercrime and fraud, fraud, so it would be great if you could tell everyone more about the role you play and when people should reach out to you. Uh, so I'll turn it over to both of you now. Congresswoman Cheryl, thank you. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Appreciate the uh, you and Kelly uh, inviting us to this uh, to this forum, and uh, thank you to the panelists for uh, allowing us to share the um, the virtual stage with you. Uh, yeah, as as you said, Congresswoman, everybody thinks the uh, Secret Service uh, is black, shiny, armored limos with agents and sunglasses around. So um, so the the cyber investigation piece is is uh, a lot of times raises eyebrows here in the community. Um, I will say, just for a quick historical uh, perspective, uh, Secret Service was formed in 1865 to combat uh, the counterfeiting of U.S. currency, um, and that has evolved to presently to um, the counterfeiting component is, is is very minute these days. It's it's, it's mostly uh, kids doing them on very sophisticated color printers, but a lot of our time now, uh, our initiatives and mission, the investigative mission is to protect the financial infrastructure of the United States. Um, and with that, any type of uh, credit card fraud, um, cyber intrusions, white collar fraud, um, and, and so on, so on. So all these, all these um, offenses touch a computer at some point, and that's where we could become involved, and that's where our focus is, is, um, is combating the nefarious actors who are out to prey on the um, – the the un, you know the the folks who are are, are not apprised of what the uh, the latest tactics are in, in the cyber realm. Um, I we could do a deep dive into specifically each of those components, but I think on a macro level, I think a couple of things that Scott and I will can touch on, and we can touch on these with some of these questions, is that you know it, it's some of the simple stuff that everyone could do today, right now after this call, is on your bank accounts, your social media accounts is a double factor authentication. So um, if you need more explanation of that, and that's simply, you know, you can, uh, if you log onto your account, use, if it's an iPhone or another device, the face ID or getting a text message. That way, if somebody was able to infiltrate your, your computer or your phone or other uh, electronic device, you have set up a, uh, a kind of a, a double lock door, so to speak, to protect yourselves. Um, and, and I think the other thing we can impart is uh, as you mentioned, a couple of those, um, a couple of those high-profile uh, scam folks that became um, one former FBI director who almost became susceptible to a, uh, a scam, and then the uh, the other individual you referenced, the doctor. Um, there's no this, the, the scammers know no bounds. It's uh, it's the affluent, it's the poor, it's you know it's it, it comes from all walks of life, and it, there is a. Um, you know, a lot of folks we speak to, there is a, um, uh, you know, there's an embarrassment factor to it. A lot of there's people fall to romance scams or, uh, again, these lottery scams, whatever, whatever gamut it runs. I, I think what I can impart, though, and really hammer home is call somebody, call law enforcement, uh, because that individual 
that who's been a victim of crime, it's not singular. We have been uh, very successful in um, prosecuting crimes with the U.S. Attorney's Office here in New Jersey uh, with a lot of these groups or syndicates, uh, cr criminal gangs, and they're using whatever funds they steal from, you know, folks here in the United States, specifically here in Jersey, it, it goes into uh, other illicit criminal, uh, you know, human trafficking, drug, uh, drug trafficking, gun sales. It, it runs the gamut. A lot of it is transnational. And the quicker law enforcement is notified, the quicker we can uh, hopefully uh, recover any funds. Um, and I'll let Scott speak to that in, uh, a little bit later on if there's a question specific to it. But the quicker we can retrieve those funds, quicker they're notified we can retrieve those funds and also, you know, uh, bring, uh, bring these uh, bad actors, uh, you know, for in front of a criminal prosecution, for criminal prosecution, excuse me. Um, so that's kind of the 10,000 foot view. Um, I'll, uh, if there's any questions, I'll, I'll leave them to later, but I just want to impart that it's, there's no, there's no embarrassment. It's, we've, we've, we've seen all walks of life who've succumbed to this, um, and we're here to help. We're very, our office is in Morristown, New Jersey. We are very heavily invested in the community. Uh, we have roots here, uh, and we don't want to see any American, but especially any, uh, you know, any, any of our folks here in New Jersey fall victim to these crimes. Um, so the, the more that we form this partnership um, with our law enforcement partners and the community, that's, what, uh, that's a key component for us to, to um, um, fulfill our mission. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. That was a really helpful overview. Um, and we'll get back to you guys with some questions from um, from uh, our call uh, people who are calling in. So now, Carrie, can you explain what you do at the New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs and how people can access your services? Yes, thanks so much, Congresswoman. It is a pleasure to be a part of this important event, and, and I thank you for including the Division of Consumer Affairs. The Division of Consumer Affairs, or DCA, is responsible for protecting New Jersey's consumers. We enforce laws designed to ensure fairness and integrity in the state's commercial and investment marketplaces. DCA also assists consumers with complaints or questions about particular businesses, charities, or service providers. And here at DCA, we are committed to empowering senior citizens by providing them with the tools that they need to, to protect themselves and their loved ones against fraud. The state of New Jersey has powerful consumer protection laws, including the Consumer Fraud Act, which allows us to investigate and take action against businesses that engage in fraud, deceit, and misrepresentation. DCA's Bureau of Securities also enforces laws and regulations designed to protect investors from investment fraud. In addition to our enforcement authority, DCA regulates businesses and charities operating in New Jersey. Our regulated business includes home improvement contractors, public movers, and home health care agencies, among others. We also oversee 51 professional and occupational boards that license over 750,000 professionals in New Jersey. And you, any member of the public, can check the license or registration status of the businesses and professionals that we regulate, including doctors, pharmacists, electricians, plumbers, and beauticians. Um, it's all on our website. You can go to njconsumeraffairs.gov for more information. And I'll just say DCA's website has a wealth of information on it for residents and can guide you to the resources that you may need. Um, and this includes resources on financial fraud, which uh, is one of the fastest growing forms of elder abuse. Approximately one in five Americans aged 65 or older have been victimized by financial fraud, which is a staggering number. Um, seniors, seniors are often targeted for financial fraud through the phone and the Internet. And the most common form of elder investment fraud involves unsuitable investments, um, where unscrupulous financial professionals place senior citizens in investments that are not suitable for their needs or age. In addition, we frequently see telemarketers targeting seniors for fraudulent investments and other scams. And this can include callers claiming to be raising funds for charities, uh, but instead pocketing most or all of the funds for themselves. So I cannot stress this enough. Please do not provide personal or financial information over the phone. 
In addition to that basic rule, here are five tips that you can take to lower your chances of falling victim to fraud. One, contact DCA's Bureau of Securities to find out if an investment professional is registered in New Jersey to sell securities or provide investment advice before you invest. Two, also check with DCA to find out if a charity is registered. And if you're considering a specific charity, do a quick internet search of its name plus words like complaint, review, rating, or scam. Three, allow yourself time before you make a decision. Scammers often try to rush people into making an investment, a donation, or a payment. Legitimate businesses and charities won't time pressure you. Four, understand the risks and restrictions regarding your investments. Now, some, investments some investments are risky, and they can tie up your money for a long time. So ask a lot of questions. And if you don't completely understand what's being sold, don't buy it. Five, feel free to say no. No is a complete answer, or uh, as I tell my kids, no thank you is a complete answer. Often people don't say no because they don't want to be rude, but fraudsters may take advantage of that. So if something isn't right for you, it's okay to say no thank you. Finally, please don't hesitate to call us. The toll-free number at DCA is 1-800-242-5846 and our website again is njconsumeraffairs.gov. We're here to help, so please call us. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Those were great tips, and we're gonna put those up on our website as well. Um, and before I move to our next panelist, I just wanna remind everyone, if you have a question, hit star three. Um, star three to ask a question. And Finally, we have our Essex County Prosecutor, Ted Stevens. Um, Ted, do you have anything to add about resources at the county level? Well, first of all, Congressman and Cheryl, I want to thank you for allowing the Essex County Prosecutor's Office to, to participate in this very valuable information event today. We're, we're very pleased to be part of it. Uh, the only thing I can add is uh, really just to emphasize, I think, as much the um, comments that have been made previously, which is that there should be no embarrassment on anyone's part in terms of if they find themselves to be victims of any crime, but especially the financial crimes that we're talking about right now. The Essex County Prosecutor's Office, as I'm sure you know, Congresswoman, and many on the call know, is the chief law enforcement entity for Essex County, and we either assist or are primarily responsible for prosecution of crimes in our county. We're the largest and the busiest prosecutor's office in the state of New Jersey, and we have the dubious distinction of addressing uh, approximately one-third of the violent crime in the state. However, like all others on the call, um, we are experiencing an increase in fraud, especially involving the elderly. The first step should, all, should always be to uh, contact both law enforcement, local law enforcement, and then simultaneously your bank or whether financial institution or whoever was involved in terms of the fraud uh, that we're, we're talking about. Uh, obviously, the uh, local law enforcement will take a report and will try to assist and to try to find the perpetrators of the crime. But also individuals need to move as quickly as they can because there may be an opportunity to actually prevent funds from moving to an intended location or unintended one, and then perhaps even get the retrieve the funds at some point in the future. But clearly moving quickly is um, to be stressed. So those are the main points I'd like to add at, at this point. I'd also like to introduce a, a young man who's with me, uh, Walter Durkin, who is the Chief Assistant Prosecutor in charge of our Financial Crimes uh, Unit, which primarily deals with these issues. Walter, do you have anything? Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, Congresswoman, and, and uh, I guess uh, one of the things that we should think about is the, the shifts that we've seen in the elderly population, the frauds against them, appear to correspond with the uh, prevalence of uh, computer use uh, increasing amongst the elderly. Uh, we've seen in our society in general the explosion of dating websites and everyone uses them, uh, particularly the elderly. And when the elderly are seeking out the companionship through a dating website, we've seen a lot of fraudsters take advantage of that relationship. Uh, so it's something to be very mindful of because we're seeing, we're 
our frauds primarily took place over the telephone uh, or in person 10 or 12 years ago. We're now seeing it uh, more through the internet. And the other thing I do want to echo is the, the greatest barrier to prosecuting or eradicating the uh, fraud against the elderly is the stigma of reporting, uh, the, the thought of shame of emba and embarrassment. And we, we all know when we pick up the phone, uh, young or old, and somebody tells us something's wrong, uh, somebody in our family is injured, our inclination is to help. And it's no different for the elderly. Uh, there should be no shame or embarrassment in reporting when somebody's committed a crime against you. And usually it's the first step necessary to uh, get to a point of safety. And the last thing I'd like to leave you with is just, just remember that when something happens, law enforcement is here for you. Uh, you should not be ashamed or embarrassed to report to law enforcement. We're here to serve you, we're here to protect you, and we're here to prevent the, these crimes and do what we can once they've occurred. Thank you. Well, thanks to both of you. I really do appreciate that. And acting quickly is so important. I know a member of my family who um, had been the victim of an uh, internet or, or a phone call fraud um, called the bank quickly and they were able to put a block on any um, transfer of money. So that is a really important tip as well. I'm going to turn things over now to Jill Hirsch, my other district director, to get to questions. If, remember, if you have a question, you can dial star three on your keypad at any time to be connected with someone on my staff, and you'll be placed in the queue to ask your question live. So, Jill? Thanks, Congresswoman, and thank you to all our guests again for being here with us. Before we turn to live questions, I wanted to ask you, um, as Kelly mentioned before, we had a number of pre-submitted um, questions. One of the biggest recurring questions we received from them, um, Herman from East Hanover asked, how do seniors report scams? Thanks, Jill. Bobby, you want to take a first crack at that question? Sure. Um, yeah, so um, I think it's, everybody has given some great advice about contacting the financial institution immediately. Um, for our purposes, um, I will give our office number, um, you know, depending on this, listen, for any amount of money losing, moving out of somebody's account is, is, is big, you know, that's uh, subjective. But what I would suggest is they could, they could call, you could call your local, you know, local police department, um, and then they could contact, if, if they're willing to help, that's something they could contact us with. The local police department is not um, has the capability, depending on the municipality, to um, to 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 work some of these financial crimes. Uh, at, at the end of the day, they can contact the, uh, the police department and then contact us. I'll give you the number uh, for our office is 973-971-3100, um, and we will you know if you know, as as you know with some of the the prosecutor limits. With the U.S. Attorney's Office, we might not be able to prosecute it at the federal level, but as I kind of really um, hit home that we're here in the community, we want to help. So if we can't take that that uh, that, uh, that 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 case to pro complete prosecution, we can certainly help our local partners and help the constituents as well, pointing them in the right direction and give them some um, you know some guidance of what to do. But again, the, I think the theme is. Contact the, the uh, a, a uh, law enforcement agency and the um, and their financial institutions. That's great, um, Carrie or Ted. Do you guys have anything else to add? Thank you. Yes, this is Carrie. I would just urge anybody who has a consumer complaint to file to go to our website again, njconsumeraffairs.gov, and you can file a complaint online through that website. Um, and I would also ask that if you have any documentation um, to add to your complaint, to upload it, it there, you have, you'll have the ability to um, provide any evidence or documentation along with your complaint. Um, save whatever you can, keep communications, keep records, um, and, and send it all our way. Got it. Thanks so much. Um, let's see. And I'm sorry to uh, interrupt. One more. If, I'm, I'm sorry, Congressman. Yep. One more. If I could add one more uh, item to that. Um, sure. We do work. Um, we have a great relationship with the FBI. Um, so it's, you know, I know there's a reputation that the, uh, that the federal law enforcement or federal or agencies, you know, uh, uh, 
have rivalries. Uh, we have a great relationship with them there. So I, I, I'd be, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, for making contacts. So can we run the whole gambit? Uh, FBI IC3. They do. They their folks can log on uh, online to re- make uh, make reports. And then uh, Federal Trade Commission FTC.gov. I think they make reports on that as well. But I'm just kind of I want to cover all the bases just to show what the uh, what outlets uh, constituents can have out there for them. But again, at the end of the day, pick up the phone and uh, we'll answer it and we'll, 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 you know, we'll get them the help they need. Thanks so much. I, I, I just want to echo if I can. I'm so sorry. Just what Robert yep, said. Please. The um, the um, and entities working together, the the old, uh, the I guess the adage that individuals, uh, a lot of the alphabet groups were all kind of in their own silo. That is definitely passe. Um, we have had, I've enjoyed since being the prosecutor here, a great working relationship with the law enforcement on the, the state and the federal level. It's been essential. I don't know how we get anything done without it. So he's right, I think, to make that, uh, make that, uh, that um, comment. Um, the first thing, of course, so law enforcement, to get to them, local law enforcement, as quickly as possible, for the, especially for the immediate issue in front of you, because everybody's got their own individual case. But on a broader issue, the FTC um, address that um, Robert talked about, we have one here, reportfraud.ftc.gov. Again, repeating, reportfraud.ftc.gov is also one they want to hear about scams because this often is uh, a larger, a part of a larger syndicate that um, they are collecting information about, and uh, they can hopefully, hopefully come uh, uh, reach some resolution um, on a global level. And um, but the best way to prevent and to combat fraud is uh, to try to prevent it. You know, so we need to make sure that individuals take steps early on. Uh, people on this call uh, may have trusted individuals in their family uh, who they work with regularly who they need to keep up to date on things. And if not, and even some of the younger people on the call, we want to reach out for other individuals to make sure that we're keeping track of them, um, that there's not a lot of idle time, especially on the computer, where we worry about younger folks getting in trouble on a computer. And obviously that um, can happen with older people as well. Um, other documents are put in place, the, the tried and true powers of attorney and things like that can be helpful. They can also be um, dangerous too. So uh, you need trained professionals, a legal team to work with for, so that everyone can kind of put together a plan of operation and protection that's uh, kind of stylized for the individual. I just wanted to add that. That's great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, really helpful as far as how people go about reporting it. Uh, Jill, I'll pass it back to you for our next question. All right, thank you, everybody. Tom from Randolph receives a message that states, your Amazon or credit card account is being charged $1,200 for an Apple notebook iPad. Please call us at dot, dot, dot. His question, and I think all of ours, is what do we do knowing this is a lie? Thanks, Jill. Carrie, you want to take this one first? Sure. Um, so, look, the first thing that um, that Tom should do in that situation is reach out directly to his accounts and make sure that there's no unexplained withdrawals or no fraudulent um, charges on, on his accounts. Um, he should not reach back out. He should not attempt to contact the phone number or um, reply to any links. He should not click on any links. Um, and that's, I think, the, the critical thing to do, and that's in terms of protecting himself. And then, of course, the next step would be reporting it um, all the ways that we've just discussed, um, myself, ASAC Hernandez, and Prosecutor Stevens. That's great. Um, any anybody else want to add to that, or should we move on to the next question? All right, I'm going to move on. Yeah, yep. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, hi. This is Scott Keener from the Secret Service. Uh, yeah, I just want to follow up. What she said is is absolutely accurate. Uh, I, I've been getting these text messages also, and I think what the important thing for people to realize is, like she said, don't don't click on the links. 
Um, don't use the information that they've provided. If it's something about your bank, turn your bank card over and call the number on the back of your bank card. Google the contact information for Netflix or Amazon or whatever company it is. Google the contact information for that. Take the time to take the next step to try and find the accurate information instead of trying to go back through. Don't respond to the text message. Delete it. Um, uh, it's the same thing for emails. Don't click on any links. Don't. Uh, I, I just delete them immediately. Um, and for the last thing I want to say, if you're getting any phone calls about stuff like this, um, what I tell people when I do presentations is if you don't recognize the phone number that's coming in, don't answer the phone. Um, you should all be answering things that, you know, when, a, when a, a name comes up that you recognize, answer it. If not, somebody will text you or leave a voicemail. Um, don't get tricked into these people when they, when they pick up the phone or when you pick up the phone and answer it, they have a script. They know exactly what questions to ask. They know exactly how to steer you. If you answer one way, they've got the script written on how to answer you. If you answer another way, they've got another script on how to answer you. Um, they're very professional. Um, they're very good at what they do, and it's very easy to manipulate you to do things that they want you to do. Yeah, I think people that I've spoken to uh, who've been victims of this uh, are all kind of astounded because many of them have thought, oh, I would never get caught up in this type of thing, and yet they do have very particular ways of really engaging and making themselves seem legitimate. Um, Jill, back to you. Okay, great. Uh, one last pre-submitted question, and then I'm going to start taking some callers live. Um, again, if you want to dial star three to get in the queue, that's how you get into the line for live questions. Marlene from Jefferson Township asks, we are now access our bank accounts via apps on our iPhone. Are there things we should be aware of? Are there security concerns? Do we have any insurance covered for fraud using those apps? Thanks, Jill. How about we turn that over to Prosecutor Stevens to start? Thank you, Congresswoman. Unfortunately, there is no insurance that we're aware of for apps uh, like that. Um, it is um, a very difficult situation. It's, it's almost like a buyer or a purchaser beware, um, I'm sorry to say. Um, the important thing to do is, I think, just to continue to monitor your accounts through the normal methods that you do access your bank, uh, whether, whether it's telephone or whether it is online, uh, in order to just keep track on information and to uh, do what some of the prior um, panelists have talked about in terms of following up on some of the charges uh, or the information you get through the normal, through the normal methods. Um, and also to check your bank's uh, policies with regard to how they, um, they deal with um, fraud uh, to make sure that you're moving as expeditiously as possible. But as insurance, which was the main question, I'm not aware of any. Thank you. And then, Bobby or Scott, do you have any information from sort of the national viewpoint? Yes, this is Scott Keenan. I, I just wanted to add also to, to, for people to monitor their credit reports. Um, you can also go on to your, you, you call one of the credit bureaus and put a freeze on your account. If we're talking about the elder community and they're probably not um, in the business of going out and, and getting credit anymore, you can freeze your accounts. Uh, and then when you are ready to, you call them back and unfreeze it. Uh, so it gives you a little more control and then make sure you're checking your credit reports. You get a free one every year, uh, but just monitor that stuff too. As well. uh, as far, um, yeah, go ahead. As far as the question on the apps and the insurance, I don't, like the prosecutor said, I don't know of any insurance, but uh, as far as using the banking apps on your phone, uh, you know, we're, it's, you know, we're, everything is mobile, we're, everybody's on the go, I do it as well. Um, I, I made reference to it in my opening remarks, the two-factor authentication, make sure you have that established. And then just be careful where you use it. I mean, don't use Wi-Fi, um, you know, uh, you know, in public places. Uh, you just make sure if, if you do, I, I, I don't, I don't do any banking or anything like that on Wi-Fi. Um, to be honest with you, even in my own home, and I've got some crazy pass, you know, 16 plus digit password on my Wi-Fi at home. 
Um, but I even don't do it at home. So I would uh, just be very wary of where you uh, where you're using your device. Um, and the uh, the less public place, the the better. Thanks so much, um, Joe. Back to you. Great. Our first caller is Leslie from Morristown. Leslie, you are on the line. Hi. Thank you so much. Hi, Congressman. Hi, Kelly. Um, recently, I received a voicemail uh, about an outstanding debt and, a, and an appearance in court, which I ignored, but they reached out to my daughter. And she then was nervous and called me, this is something that's going on. So my question was, what do we also tell our family uh, when someone is calling asking for information about us? Wow, that's a great question. Um, and thanks for calling, Leslie. Um, Carrie, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Hi, Leslie. This is Carrie Fayez. How are you? Um, look, I'm so sorry that they called your daughter. I'm sure that was stressful for for you and for her. Um, I, I'll repeat what I said before. The basic rule is do not provide any personal or financial information to somebody who's calling you. Um, and to you know, to, to quell any concerns that you or your daughter might have in that instance, you can always call the court. Call, look up, Google the number for the court and call them and say, um, you know, look, I, I received this phone call claiming that I have to appear in court. Can you please check and verify that? Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. And, you know, all the, the I, I hate to admit that occasionally someone in my family <laughs> Um, has received a speeding ticket, for example, and you have a, a court summons, and um, that comes through the mail. I've, uh, you know, I've always had paperwork if there's anything like that. Um, and so I think that's something to educate your family on as well, that, that generally um, there's usually paperwork associated with it, but certainly if there is a telephone call that you're suspicious of, calling the court itself is always a good way to do that, but also a good, I think, experience as a parent to be talking to your your young children. I think many of us as parents and, and older people assume that our children are more savvy than we are when it comes to the internet, um, and yet these kind of fraud schemes wouldn't necessarily be in, in their purview. So a good time to educate our kids too on, some, on how you know careful you have to be on the internet and with some of these fraud schemes. Um, Let's see, I'll go back to Jill for our next question. Thanks, Congresswoman. Next on the line, I have Pat from Fairfield. Pat, you're on the line to ask your question. Good afternoon, and thank you so much. I appreciate this information more than you know. Uh, I consider myself to be pretty educated on security since I originally came out of that work in the 70s. But it um, seems like things are changing. So my dilemma, uh, I don't use the computer uh, unless absolutely necessary. I kind of feel like a prisoner almost with the way things are. You can't do this. You can't do that. Uh, so I learned to protect myself. But I got a call uh, or a letter uh, about some unclaimed funds. So um, it was actually a letter where I had to go pick it up. So okay. Um, they told me to fill it out or call. So I call, and then they ask for my information, like my social. So I say, um, no, I'm not going to do that. So, uh, well, they said, well, then you can fill this out and send it within 30 days. And then, so I filled it out with not much information. And then um, next thing I know, I look in the paper, and it was on claim funds. <laughs> but they didn't wait the 30 days. And now what do I do to get the on claim funds? is give out my social again, and I'm not going to do that. So it leaves me in a pickle. But thank you for all this other information. It is a well of information. Thank you. And God bless. Wow, thanks for calling. Yeah, that is a tough one. Um, Bobby, do you have some suggestions for Pat? Um, I don't have anything. I, I, I've not heard that specifically. I, I, you know, it's, I had an incident when I was living in, uh, DC that, 
Um, I forgot what it was. It was I overpaid. I closed an account or whatever, and I had funds somewhere. And I, I, I did it online. Uh, so Pat not being want to do it online, um, you know, th that is makes things much more difficult. Uh, she did the right thing by, you know, using caution. Um, so kudos for her on that. Um, but I, I don't. I, we could try to do some homework on it, honestly, and you know, see if there's any ha bunny has any experience with that. I, I, I would need a little more specifics on where the unclaimed funds from. Was it from a municipality, a state government? Um, or whatnot, but um, yeah, that one I, um, you know, we, we can definitely get back to you or help her if she wants to give us a ring. We can uh, we can try to guide her through that. Thank you. you we have what? her information and we can get it to you. Congresswoman, thanks, Joe. Con 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 thanks. Yep. This is Ted. I uh, just wanted to say first of all the. Um, Two points. One is that one commonality thing, commonality among scammers, is that whether they're talking about offering you a prize or they're they're bringing a problem to you, they want you to act expeditiously right away. And in just about every situation we've talked about, that that kind of speed is just not important. It's much more. I think the young lady who called did the right thing. Take your time. Be cautious about it. And uh, that usually will not hurt you, even in a court situation, if you're moving, you know, with some dispatch. But it's rarely that you need to move immediately to address this situation. Uh, with regard to unclaimed funds specifically, when I was, I did, dealt with them a lot when I was a surrogate, and so it's really important to know that uh, there are state websites, New Jersey particularly has a great website, which um, looks ex extremely official. You know, you go online, if she's not adept or doesn't trust uh, going online, someone else can do that for her, um, and that you can find out if there are unclaimed funds and make the application directly through that website. The letter she may have received may be from some companies that are, that are legitimate companies, and they will notice that you have access to some unclaimed property. But the rub there is that for the privilege of them bringing that to your attention, they're going to take some of that or keep some of that as their finder's fee, so to speak. And that's totally unnecessary um, that you can just go directly to the website and collect all the funds yourself. That's really helpful. Thanks so much. And yeah, maybe it was, um, you know, probably a little bit of a clue that it wasn't a scam from Pat's story, the fact that they gave her, you know, some time to fill out a form and stuff like that. But that's also a good tip to call directly to the unclaimed fund. Thanks so much, Ted, for that. Um, Jill, think, what, one last thing with, uh, for Pat. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry, Congresswoman Cheryl, if I can add um, for one more thing for Pat. Um, we have at DCA seen scams um, where people do send out very official looking um, fraudulent letters along the lines of the kind that, that Pat described. And so I would just echo what Prosecutor Stevens said, which is go to the New Jersey Treasury's um, website or call the New Jersey Treasury Department um, and they have an unclaimed property um, department that that can help you. Um, so go straight to the government source um, and be wary of letters received in the mail like that. Thanks so much. Uh, you have this, yeah, sorry, this is Bobby again. Um, uh, Scott just brought up the, um, she could find, since she's not online, um, I think newspapers uh, will put those, I'm not sure what section that is, but they will uh, put those notices out there for unclaimed funds. Um, so that might be one way of her uh, kind of cross-checking uh, to see if it's legit or not. That's great, too. Thanks so much. Um, Jill, back to you. Great. We have time for two more questions. I'm going to bring live Kevin from Hapatcom. Kevin, you're live for your question. Hi. Um, <clears> Hi. <throat> your person that uh, my wife's debit card has been compromised I think five or six times this year so far uh, from online stuff um, and so we we see the charge it's not we don't recognize it so we call Wells Fargo and they block it and da 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 well they just keep sending a card and when I ask them is there something we can do 
there's silence and they say, well, we can send you another card. Um, but my, it's just my wife. Now, you know, I have a separate debit card number, but they just focus on her and it's all, she's done it through the computer. I'm wondering, did they have access to her computer at this point? That's interesting. Um, Bobby, do you want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, I think uh, Scott and uh, would join me. I, I will say with the bank for stuff online, um, I would, I mean, it sounds like Wells Fargo has been pretty uh, customer friendly with them and uh, they've been able to recoup their charges. But um, if, if it continues to happen, I don't know how, uh, you know, how long they will be um, so generous. So even though they're not at fault, you know, I would recommend them using a credit card. You know, usually those purchases are, are uh, have a little more security with them with the uh, with the banks. Um, as far as the uh, and uh, if it's all online, I, I think you have to pinpoint what websites you're going to. Or they uh, is that gentleman still online? No, he's not. But so, he's listening. Uh, okay. Well, just for the overall group, you know, or if he's still listening, is it the same vendor? Um, or is it different, you know, if it's the same vendor, then, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, it, it, it may look circumstantial, but if, uh, if there's smoke, there's fire, so to speak. Um, so I think it, there's some caution there. Um, and he can contact the vendor direct and saying this continues to happen. Um, I don't know if it's something like Amazon or if it's more of a, uh, small business type, uh, setting where this is being used. Uh, as far as computers are hacked, uh, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, that's, uh, the computers get hacked sometimes, as we talked about earlier, any kind of phishing, uh, phishing scams, any kind of emails that you might get that you're not aware of. Uh, if you're getting an email from somebody you're not expecting one from, don't open it. And certainly don't open uh, any attachments that are, are, are connected to that email. Don't forward, the, don't forward that email on to somebody and say, hey, is this a phishing, exam, uh, phishing scam? Because then they're going to wind up clicking it and opening it. Um, that's the way they get into your system. They send out these scams that look like they're real. Uh, and as soon as you click on the link in that email, then that gives them access to your computer. Um, so, I mean, depending about the, you know, the, how expensive these charges are, um, you know, I, I don't know all these specifics about this story, but uh, there, there could be something somebody could have access. And the only thing I want, and I want to add, uh, piggyback on Scott, if, if somebody thinks their computer, if they've opened up something and opened up an attachment, uh, I'll, I'll give this analogy for those who are not as, um, you know, cyber savvy. Um, the analogy is if somebody breaks into your house, uh, you rip the locks, they, they took the TV, uh, you change the door, change the locks, put a new security system on, but you don't check the attic. And when you leave, they come out of the attic and they come and steal this TV you just bought and the jewelry and whatever else you may have hidden. It's the same thing with a computer. If you think your your system has been compromised, they need to get that checked out. You know whether that's to you know they they need first of all they need to have virus protection on all their computers, get those updates from this reputable you know Norton antivirus. There's there's a ton of them out there that we could help us stitch them out, give some recommendations. Um, but if they they believe they've been hacked, they you know they need to uh, you know, stop the bleeding, so to speak, and, you know, find out what's in their computer and get it out of there. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's just a dog chasing his tail. You know, they, the bad actor is going to just continue to do what they're doing, uh, regardless of how many debit cards they get or how many credit cards they get. That's helpful as well. Um, thanks so much. Back to you, Jill. Thank you. I'm going to do one last question from our live callers. Um, this is David from Pompton Plains. David, you are on the line. Yes, I'd like to know what Congress is doing to stop the damn robocalls. Yes, thank you, David. Um, last Congress, I voted for, and the Senate passed as well, and it was signed into law, the TRACE Act, to crack down on illegal robocalls. The legislation actually strengthens the FCC's enforcement capabilities, enabling them to impose greater penalties and more time to conduct investigations against offenders. It also establishes the framework for an industry traceback program to rapidly identify the origins of unlawful robocalls. The FCC has already put these tools to use, recently imposing a fine of $225 million against a telemarketer that made over 1 billion unlawful calls. 
We still have more work to do. I'm currently working with colleagues in the House and Senate to strengthen resources to go after bad actors and provide more support for Americans affected by robocalls and scams. Um, so we will continue to do that. But part of the reason we're holding this town hall, too, is to hear from constituents about the issues they're facing and to also have law enforcement on the call so we can understand how Congress can strengthen those tools. So I, I really do appreciate everyone's time today. And um, it, was, it was great to have you, Bobby, Scott, Carrie, and Ted, and uh, to hear from you as well. Walter, thanks so much for joining us. I really do appreciate it. Um, I, when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I worked with um, the Secret Service and the Essex County Prosecutor's Office and actually Carrie, <laughs> um, so when she was there as well. So these are just such great panelists and, and great organizations, and we're really lucky to have that here in the 11th District. If we didn't get to your question today, my team and I are ready to help you get an answer. You can email my office at cheryl.house.gov slash contact or call our offices. Our DC office number is 202 225-5034, that's 202-225-5034. And our district office here in Parsippany is 973-526-5668. That's 973-526-5668. My caseworker team has been monitoring the questions and will reach out to people as needed to see how we can help. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram for the latest updates from my office. I also have a newsletter with updates on my work in Washington, which you can sign up for at cheryl.house.gov. So thank you again for joining today. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and please take care. Thanks so much.